Kirby Smart, head football coach at University of Georgia, um, here on behalf of our family, our players, our university, Charlene, Dave, um, again, just so much love for your son. Um, he impacted my life personally, but the beacon of light everybody speaks about, he lit up our entire organization and our entire building on a daily basis. And hearing Coach Whitehead say those words, so much of that rang true uh, for the three years we got to experience uh, with Devin Willick. I mean, he, he, he was as different a person. And it's so funny to hear Coach say it because you never said that Devin tried to portray toughness, although he was extremely tough. He never tried to be the smartest one in the room, and he probably was. He was incredibly different. You know, we had a team meeting uh, recently the other day, and I asked the team, I said to each one of you, I want to challenge you. I want every guy in this room to think about a way that we can memorialize Devin Willett. And if you think of a way, I want you to come to me. I want you to tell me what your thought process is. Send me a text, call me, communicate with me some way, shape, or form in a room of probably 100 young men and his teammates. After the meeting, I had at least 30 guys standing in a line that wanted to represent, wanted to memorialize Devin in a certain kind of way. I've had multiple guys call, reach out, because he impacted them. He impacted all of us. What a special, special, special young man Devin Willick was. I've told some of these um, stories before, but I'd like to share a couple of them with the friends and family here that weren't able to come to Athens. Um, but you know, when I thought about the words, and no words can describe what Devin Willick meant to the University of Georgia and what he meant to our family. When I thought about words, I thought about the word different. He was so different in so many ways. And it started in recruiting. You know, people don't know the story of, of Devin driving on a Greyhound bus. He came eight, he rode 18 hours down to the University of Georgia to go to a camp for one day. For one day, I can remember sitting in our indoor and watching this large man, this huge man, just work out. He was extremely quick and athletic at 6'7", 350 pounds. And I thought to myself, God, we, there's just nobody this size that moves like this. Well, he didn't earn a scholarship offer then. He came back a second time and worked out. And he knew exactly what he wanted. And in the end, around December of his, his uh, recruiting year, Coach Luke, who came up and spoke with us, went to his home, got to visit with him, and convinced Devin to come down on an official visit. We offered him a scholarship, and he took it immediately and said, this is where I want to go to school. He knew what he wanted. He didn't play games. He didn't wait around. He didn't do the hat tricks. He said, I want to go to the University of Georgia, and he chose to go to the University of Georgia. He knew exactly what he wanted, and he did. He loved that place. You saw it every day, the way he behaved and practiced. You know, I talk about academics. Jonas is here, and Jonas is our director of player development, and he spent a lot of time with Devin away from the building. And I asked, you know, each part of our organization to share their favorite trait about Devin Willick, the things they'll always remember about Devin Willick. And when you talk to everybody in academics, it's interesting to hear Coach Whitehead talk about him and economics and sharing those conversations. Because when you talk to his academic counselors who spent time with him away from football, you talk to Jonas Jennings who spent time with him away from football, the word intellectually curious comes up. This young man was intellectually curious. He changed his major multiple times, had multiple semesters over a 3.0, was majoring in sports management, but had a minor in landscape studies. And I never forget talking to Ian Horvat, who's his, his counselor. He said he was always plotting to see how he could graduate at a certain time with certain hours and get minors and majors and study different things. That's different. That's different. You know, it's not every one of our players that choose to come to the University of Georgia over majors and, and education. Most of them see it as a pathway to the NFL. He saw it as an opportunity to learn. 
He was so bright, so bright, and so fun to be around and carry on a conversation with about academics. You know, in competition, it didn't change either. In this day and age we live in today, where it's a, a me now, I want to be successful now, I can, can I play now? He, he spent two years, really a year and a half, developing. He, was, he, he, he wasn't impatient. He didn't come to me the first year and say, why am I not starting? He wasn't ready to start, but all he did was work. And I, I can recall a conversation in his second season when we were, we was, it was a backup and we were using him as a two and he was practicing with the, the ones and twos. He was down on the other end going against the defensive scout team. And he sent me a text and he said, coach, you know, can, can I go da- back down to the offensive scout team so I can go against Jordan Davis, Devontae Wyatt, Trevon Walker, who were first and second round, first round picks. This, this young man wanted to go against the best and if he wasn't going to start, he wanted to get better. That was in his second year. Spring of last year, he comes in and he's got a tough decision to make. Battle it out or run or run. He said, I'm staying, coach. I'm competing. Started two games for us, played in every game. He didn't run from competition. He ran to it. He embraced it. And he was physically tough while he did it. You know, in a room, and I talk about this all the time, the O-line room is the largest room in the building. I mean, literally the largest room, the biggest human beings you have are in the offensive line. They have a special bond. Coach Charles is going to talk in a few minutes about that bond. But he was the largest. He was different. He was the largest man in a room full of large men. Okay? I mean, literally six foot seven, 335 pounds. And he was the biggest guy there. And, and I, I talked with uh, Collier Perno, who's our nutritionist, and I said, Collier, what sticks out to you most about your conversations with Devin? Because like Coach talked about, you know, when Devin first got there, he wasn't 335 pounds. He was a little bit bigger than that. And he knew to be at his best, he had to shave some weight off, and he had to get his what we call body fat percentage down. Devin reached out to Collier this last summer, I didn't even know this until uh, I talked with her and said, Miss Collier, and that's, that's the way he addressed everybody. That's Devin Willard. He addressed everybody, Miss Collier, Miss Christina, Coach Smart, first class. He said, it's really important to me that I get my body fat from 24 to 22%. What do I have to do? She said, you'll have to gain about six pounds of muscle and lose about four pounds of fat, and he went to it over the summer. This fall, when we did the numbers before the season, he lost six pounds. I mean, he gained six pounds of muscle, lost four pounds of fat, and he was 21% body fat. He had reached his goal. He had done it by his habits, the things he chose to do. That takes such great discipline. It takes a lot of discipline in our place when they got food all over the place that you can eat anytime you want. Devin chose not to do that. He, he chose to be at his best. That's different. We, we, we don't have guys that initiate that and then stand by it and go do it. But bigger than his stature, as we all know, who know Dev, was his heart. I mean, this guy's heart was so big. He cared so much. Uh, treated everybody with respect all the time. I mean, you just could coach a lifetime and never have a kid that did it right. We, we, talk, we talk about lists at our place, not being on the list, you know, and missing a class or missing an event. And I love these young men, but most of them have been on a list, okay? Devin was never on a list. He didn't get on a list. He did what he was supposed to do. He was there on time, always respectful. We love Dev. We love Dev for what he stood for, you know. Um, and I say this because it's the personal story that touches me the most. The three seasons he was there, I think I added up to like 42 or 41 games that I got to experience, uh, with Devin Willick and Thomas Settles, our team chaplain who does a a wonderful service before every game. It's usually four and a half hours before kickoff. We eat pregame meal at four four hours before kickoff. So 30 minutes before pregame meal, he offers an optional chapel service in which I get to attend every game. So for 42 games, I got to sit two seats over from Devin Willick. 
right side, second row, two seats over. I knew he was going to be there. He knew I was going to be there. We didn't speak. We didn't talk much there. But I knew he had accepted Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. And I know where he is today. And he is a special, special young man. And he is gone too soon, but he has never forgotten. We love your son. And we comfort you and condolences to all of his family. Thank you. I'm Stacy Searles. I'm the offensive line coach in Georgia. Dave and Charlene, I just thank you so much for sharing your son with us. You know, usually when I'm before this group of men, we're talking about team run, what we're going to do in practice, what we got to do in goal, short yardage and goal line and things like that. But today I'm before you and I get to talk about Devin Willett. It's usually not a, a great trait of an offensive lineman to be the nicest kid around. But Devin Willick's the nicest kid I've ever coached. Yes, sir. No, sir. You've heard it from his high school coach. You've heard it from his head coach. Me as a position coach, I got to deal with him on a daily basis. You know, my wife, uh, Trish, would bring in on Friday, she'd bring in cookies. She'd bring in buffalo chicken dip. She'd bring in Koneka sausage, which a lot of you folks don't know, but it's really good. And Devin learned to love it. And Devin would hug my wife, and I was afraid he's going to hurt her because she's so little and he's so big. You know, back in the spring, Coach talked about Devin having to make a decision, and he sat in my office. And, you know, I was new. I got there last, last, last year about this time, a little later. And uh, Devin wasn't sure. He wasn't sure about me. He wasn't sure about his opportunity. And we sat there and we talked. I said, Devin, just one day at a time. Just breathe, man. Just breathe. And man, did he thrive. That kid came to work every day. And for you that don't know, if football football's really hard. Coach will, coach will tell you that. But at the University of Georgia, and I've coached a lot of places, it's the hardest place there is, but it's the best place to be. Because iron sharpens iron. And the battles you'll see the battles I got to witness on a daily basis. You guys may, may or may not know Chaz Chambliss. We would run the counter, and I could see those two butting heads like two big rams. All right? Jalen Carter may be the first pick of the draft this year. And like Coach said, Devin wanted to go against him. And, man, when he, he stuck that right hand in and he stayed square, it was a thing of beauty. Devin worked at it. And he influenced these young men here because we compete in that room. There's a lot of good players that can play. And they all played. They all played. You know, some of the, the funny things about Devin, he had this bad habit. He always wanted to turn left. All right? I accused him of being a NASCAR driver. He always wanted to go around that circle, go to the left. You know, he's 6'7". All right? And sometimes he'd get too high. Coach Smart told me to said, tell him to stay as low as uh, Micah Muse. Muse is about 5'5 five, five wide receiver, a little bitty dude. And I told Muse, I said, if you see him get higher than you, I said, you go punch him. Because Muse is a tough guy too. But uh, the, the brotherhood in our room, and I know our guys will talk about it. I heard this, but, you know, me and Tate Rattles, we like sausage and biscuits. We like gravy and biscuits. And Devin... <laughs> Devin eats bagels. Oh, you guys up here like the bagels. But that was something we would, we would laugh about and pick at each other. In the O-line room, there's nothing off limits. There's no subject off limits because it's a brotherhood. And what happens in that room stays in that room, you know. I talked to these young men the night before our national championship game. And I apologized to them. I told them... <clears throat> I read you wrong. When I first got there, it was the most talented room I've ever coached. And I thought they were a bunch of individuals. I was wrong. You know, a story that, that I like to share about these guys, there's, 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 there's uh, a few guys in our room that aren't on scholarship. They have to pay their own way to go to school. 
the guys in that room pooled their money where those kids could eat lunch with us every day. And Devin was right at the heart of that because he's such a good person and cared about each other. But I told these guys, I'm proud to be your coach. I'm proud to be a part of this unit. And I'm proud to be a part of, of, of what Devin Willick st stood for. You know, Devin played his best in the, in the biggest games. The Oregon game, I'll never forget. The last thing we look at before we go to play on Saturday, our last meeting, all it is is a highlight reel of what these guys have done the week before. And the first, the first one on there, I'll never forget, is Devin Willick on the nuke screen catching their best linebacker at the top of the numbers, which is about 17 yards from the field, from the sideline, and knocking them underneath their coach's feet. All right? What a player. You know, the way he played against Tennessee, the way he played against LSU and, 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 and Ohio State and TCU, those things will always stick in my mind. And those memories you can always be proud of, all right? But the best thing about Devin Willard was his heart, his love for his teammates, his love for his family. Words can't take away the sting, but I am thankful to the good Lord I'm thankful to this family for sharing Devin Willett with us. God bless. How y'all doing? I'm uh, Cedric Van Pran. I'm the center of the University of Georgia. I had the pleasure of playing uh, to the left and right of Devin. Um, before I get started, I um, want to send my condolences to the family and the community of Jersey. Um, understand this is tough for all of us. Um, but when I think about Dev, genuinely, I think of the word pride. Um, just the pride that he had in his family, his friends, um, and the pride that he had in the community of Jersey. Um, <laughs> and ironically, that was kind of some of uh, you know, what we got into when we poked fun at each other was the fact that I'm from New Orleans, uh, down south, and uh, he's from Jersey, and we would always go back and forth with each other in a joking way. And, you know, he would always talk about, you know, how bad New Orleans was in the crime, and, you know, I would talk about how bad, you know, in my opinion, the football is. And, um, you know, Devin would always stop. And uh, the same smirk that's on this, uh, this pamphlet, um, he would look at me and he'd smack his teeth. He'd be like, bro. New Orleans stinks, bro. Nobody wants to go to that dumpster. So <laughs> he would always give me that, and that would always end the conversation because what can you say after that? Um, and, and genuinely, um, I just thank the family and the community of Jersey for sending Devin there um, to us to allow him to be a part of our brotherhood because I don't know where I would be without Devin genuinely. Devin made the most of every situation. When we had team runs in the summer or – we were getting down to uh, being a month into practice before a game in Ohio State, and the one thing he's telling us said is not that bad. In about two weeks, you'll be getting ready to go home and see your family. And that's the one thing that he always said, no matter what happens today, this weekend I get to go see my people. That's the one thing Devin always said. He always had an outlook on life that no matter what, he was going to find a way to be positive about it. So I genuinely just want to say that the family and the community of Jersey should be really proud of the young man that you helped raise because he was so proud of you all and what you all did for him. We appreciate you guys for sending him to us and allowing him to be a part of our lives because he changed us forever. We love you and appreciate you. How's it going, everyone? Uh, so my name is Warren Erickson. Just like said, I had the pleasure of playing uh, with Dev for the past three years. Um, you know, I'm so thankful that we got to listen to 1 Thessalonians 4.13. And, you know, there's hope in that verse because, um, you know, it speaks upon those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. And we know that Dev has fallen asleep in Jesus. So Devin is looking down on us right now. And what what's great about it and the hope is that through Jesus, we get to see our brother again. We do. But that's only through him and your love and your connection with Jesus, our Savior. And so I'm just so thankful we got to read that and have that hope of seeing him. And, um, you know, I had the blessing of knowing Devin. I sat next to him in our office line meeting room. 
uh, our friendship. It always grew through making combo blocks on the field, uh, camaraderie in the locker room, uh, as well as time, get to spin away from the facility. We always used to have, usually three times a summer, we would do O-line cookouts. And we'd be grilling out steaks and burgers and all that type of stuff. And he was the, the first person to text in the group message, like, what can I bring? Wanted to be there. He's always the first one there. How can I help? How can I clean up? Do you need to take the trash out? He was always that person. And I always thought one of his best qualities was his uh, kindness and love. He would do anything for anyone. I know this because a few weeks ago, I needed help. I needed help moving some furniture that was very, help, he- very heavy. Um, Devin answered my call right away. He met me in the parking lot. Up two flights of stairs, he carried my dresser, my bed, my bed frame, my TV, everything, all without one single hint of, man, I don't want to do this anymore, or complacency. He was that type of person. He always had a smile on his face. No matter the trials ahead, whether it was a team run, a Tuesday practice in season, he always attacked it with an uncommon-like uh, sense of uh, positivity. He was so inclusive and so accepting of everyone. The true meaning of love your neighbor as yourself. And I just want to say this. Uh, kindness and love for others is not a weakness. I see it as a strength. Devin's cut love and kindness for others, he, it made him the strongest of all of us. I can say uh, with confidence that uh, he was one of the most loved and respected in the locker room. It was almost like people kind of like gravitated themselves uh, towards him. And, uh, you know, it's hard to believe he first started playing football in high school. When he arrived at UGA, the inexperience may have shown in a few areas. But Dev, he wanted to be great. He did not want to settle. And I saw him push and work harder than anyone on the team. You know, and uh, last season he was seeing the, the benefits of all that hard work as he was a consistent contributor and starter in every single game this season. Because all he wanted to do was play football for the University of Georgia. And he was living that dream. Um, you know, I just want to circle back to the kindness. Because even in football, when it's a bunch of people going at each other and, and hitting and whatnot, Dev was kind. In the office line meeting room, Coach Sorrells, he would some days purposely be overly critical of Devin to try to get him to play maybe a little bit angrier, maybe a little more mean. And something I always respected was Devin's only response ever was, yes, sir. I got you, coach. I'm going to fix it. It was never a, a smack of the teeth and some sort of rebuttal or whatever it was. And I always respected that he was, I got it, coach. I'm going to fix it. And he handled himself in that way no matter what. Uh, during Devin's first year. I've been in the facility for five years. During his first year, I I remember uh, telling him, when you figure out how to play the game you are fully capable of, you'll be one of the best to play O-line here at UGA. And I truly believe he was just scratching that surface. Uh, I just want to leave you all with one last little challenge. Uh, You know, Devin's legacy deserves to live on. His work ethic, his love for others, and his love for Jesus. So here's the challenge. The challenge is to be like Dev. When times are tough, never give up and work just as hard as he would. Be like Dev is to welcome and be caring to others just like he was. Be like Dev is to have a relationship with our creator just like he did. Just as we saw him in the pregame chapel. Do all these things so Devin's legacy will live on because it's up to us to carry it on. Thank you all. As I sit here today, words could not express the void that has been felt in our family. We lost a son, a brother, a friend, and a confidant. Devin had the biggest smile, the largest heart. He was caring, gentle, and loving. We are blessed and better for having had him in our lives, if only for a short time. 
He left his mark and will always be remembered for his smile, his gentleness, his kind words, and his thoughtfulness. Seeing the young man he became, I'm honored to have been his mom. Amen. Devin, you left us too soon. Uh, many say that you fulfilled your role here on earth and have gone, to a greater, gone on to greater things, but I am selfish. I want you to be here with us, your family and your friends. If there is any comfort in all of this, I want to believe that you are now standing next to your big brother, Jonathan. I will miss our morning calls just to say hello or to remind you that it's time to get out of the bed. In our evening, uh, at, at, in our end of the day calls to recap your day and to say good night. I know that your brother will miss the many hours you spent on the phone together and not always just the talking. You two just had a connection in your own language. As a mother, it warms my heart to see how close you two were, a bond that continued to be strengthened as you both got older. I can never replace you in your brother's heart, but I hope that I can be there for him. If I can just replace 1% of what you guys had, it would be the equivalent of a lifetime of being loved and cherished. You also had a great relationship with your dad that most boys would envy. He taught you through example. He taught you how to be a, a responsible man, a man of your word, and most importantly, uh, the rewards of hard work, putting your head down and just pushing through. Know that you, will, you, that you will never be forgotten. As a family and as an individual people, we will strive to protect your positivity or project, to project your positivity as we move forward in our lives. We will love harder. We will hug more often. We will be swift in having a kind word and lending a helping hand. I ask that people honor your memory by adopting these principles and always keeping you in their hearts. Uh, forever. Sleep in peace, my beautiful son, forever loved and cherished and never forgotten, mom.